disturbing cults you never want to meet. Rock Theriot was one of the most brutal cult leaders in history. And yet the Canadian Ant Hill Kids is one that is rarely ever discussed. Rock Theriot was born on May 16, 1947 in Saguenay, Quebec, Canada to French-Canadian parents Hyacinthe, a house painter, and stay-at-home mother Pierrette. And Rock was one of eight children in the family home, being the second eldest. In 1950, the family moved to Thetford Mines and Rock was brought up Catholic, which is a very common religious belief system in Quebec, I think the most common, if I'm not mistaken. Rock had what many would deem to be a fairly normal upbringing, but he himself and the neighbors would say that his parents were extremely abusive towards him. The family grew up with very little money, and so the abuse was basically constant. A former neighbor, Leon Vachon, said that the boys and their father would regularly play a game called Bone, in which they would sit at a table with their heaviest boots on and kick each other as hard as they could in the shins until one of them gave in. The neighbor also says that the mother was emotionally and verbally abusive and that you could constantly hear her screaming at the kids like no other person could scream. Both of these claims his father adamantly denies, but I honestly believe that he and his siblings were abused, but specifically him, as it would explain where his desire for control and power came into play at such a young age. At eight years old, he said that he discovered his ability to heal sick people. This started as him healing a friend who had broken teeth. He then claims that he intentionally began to study mosses, herbs, and plants to refine his skills as a healer. He says that he was able to castrate cattle and pigs without them losing any blood at all. Lies! There you go! Which I'm pretty sure is impossible. Rock was super smart throughout his childhood and his entire life, but he wasn't a huge fan of school. At 13 years old, when he was supposed to be in the seventh grade, he actually just dropped out. It didn't seem like his parents cared very much, and there wasn't a huge effort to make him go back and attend school. Him dropping out of school coincided with the time that he became extremely obsessive with the Old Testament of the Bible. More specifically, the end of the world stuff, the apocalyptic stuff, that would normally be quite terrifying and intimidating to a child, but it intrigued him. He absolutely loved it. But he was more so drawn to the strict rules that the Old Testament outlined in regard to giving men authority and complete control over everything that went on. As a teenager, Rock was extremely popular, who spent a lot of his free time drinking with his friends in local clubs and bars. Some of his friends from his formative years described him as brilliant and having the gift of gab. He was described as a very good-looking young man who had these piercing blue eyes and didn't struggle at all to pull in the girls. In November of 1967, he married Francine Gernier. Early on in their marriage, he made her wear long dresses whenever she was in public, but shortly after this, he allowed her to wear mini skirts, so just kind of switched up. But this just shows that it was about the control, not about what she was wearing. Shortly after this, he went on to ask his in-laws if they would let him open a nudist camp on their farmland, to which they said, hell to the no. Rock built him and his wife their dream home, which was a quaint Swiss-style um, house down the road from his parents. The pair went on to have two children together. Rock was actually an extremely talented carpenter and wood carver, and he would sell his work as an artist, primarily selling wood carvings to support himself and his family, beer mugs, tree limbs, wooden clocks, and trophies. Just kind of whatever he could. At this point in his life, he finally seemed to be stable, healthy, and happy for the first time in his life, but unfortunately that didn't last very long. While he was in his mid-twenties, he underwent surgery in Montreal for a stomach condition of stomach ulcers. And around this time, he also began to study medical textbooks, literally memorizing them from back to front, front to back. And he would lecture everyone about human anatomy to the point where people got sick of hearing him. But this is where his obsession with medicine and surgery stemmed from. He also began to memorize his community's municipal code, which seems kind of random, but it'll make sense later on. His neighbor recalls that if there was a weakness in the law, he was able to find it and talk about how to exploit it to the fullest. That's suspicious. That's weird. He also went on to join the Aramis Club, which is a Catholic group which raised money for charities and organized local events. As he worked his way up in the social ranking of the group, people began to really question whether he was right for this job or this position. He wanted to change the rituals. He wanted new members to wear the image of Satan on their backs. I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? 
He was noted as the type of person who always wanted to become a leader, but just as he was about to become a leader in this group, people turned on him because he was trying to change things and bring in his own twisted ideas. As soon as the higher-ups heard of this, they stripped him of his position. Around this time is when his friends, who were his friends at the time, said that his behavior would become increasingly erratic and unpredictable. In 1971, Rock told his friends that he had a vision that the world would end very soon. As I mentioned before, the element of masculine control in the Old Testament really intrigued him, so he decided that he was no longer going to be Catholic, but he went and became a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A Seventh-day Adventist is a part of the Protestant Christian churches. Their origins are traced back to the United States in the mid-19th century, that unlike other Adventist denominations, which are typically quite small, the Seventh-day Adventist church is large with a membership of over 14 million people and growing, and they have congregations in over 200 countries. They are called Seventh-day Adventists as their day of worship is Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week. They avoid eating meat, they avoid consuming narcotics and stimulants, so like coffee, anything like that. What really sets them apart, however, is their heavy focus on the second coming of Christ. They believe that it is extremely close, and so they are doing whatever they can to prepare for this, as they believe that when Christ comes, he will separate the saints from the wicked, so they want to be on the side of the saints. Many Seventh-day Adventists will often predict the date of the second coming and will urge people to join their side. Now, when Rock first joined, he followed their holistic rules religiously, like he followed everything. He refused to drink, he refused to smoke, and he gave up processed food. In 1976, he and his wife divorced, and she and the kids would basically completely distance themselves from him at this point. Rock was extremely charismatic and extremely well-liked in the church, but he was also extremely manipulative, something that he had learned from a young age, and he had learned how to use religion as a way to manipulate. He quickly began to move up in the ranks, and he was on the leadership track. He was trusted enough to organize seminars for the church, but used these sessions to his advantage. He had adopted the ideology and these seminars had allowed him to preach the ideology that he was in fact the savior, that he was meant to lead, that he was put on earth with a God-given purpose to save the world from evil and prepare everyone for the upcoming apocalypse. He began to recruit members based off of this belief alone and as his following grew, he changed his name to Moses. He claimed that his main purpose was to create a commune full of free thinkers where his followers could listen to his teachings, which were said to feel like a mashup of motivational speeches and sermons, which he claimed were given to him directly from God. They were meant to live as equals amongst one another and to be free of sin. In 1977, when Rock, now known as Moses, tried to become the leader of the church, the church figured out what he was doing and they kicked him out. They were not with it at all. But they had kicked him out a little bit too late, as he had already built up a loyal following. Now, the same year that he was kicked out of the church, he moved to St. Marie de Buse and rented a space in a two-story building where he opened a homeopathic clinic and began to pass out flyers in which he advertised seminars to help people quit smoking. This allowed him to quickly become the focal point of a local alternative medicine movement. He had many supporters and he actually did a lot of interviews and things of that nature because they didn't see the cult-like tendencies that were already forming. They just saw him as this hippie who was helping people quit smoking. He went on to marry 26-year-old Giselle LaFrance. A married couple, Maurice and Jacques Chaguerre, and their one-year-old daughter were also supporters of his. Well, not really the one-year-old daughter. She was just kind of there by default. Within a year of meeting Rock, Jacques quit his job as a construction worker and Maurice resigned from her job as a secretary. When Rock was kicked out of the church, his followers left with him. He had about four men, nine women, and four children at this time. They all quit their jobs, sold their homes, gave all their material possessions and money to Rock, and together they formed the Ant Hill Kids. They were named this by Rock himself because of their ant-like hard work. I found this name to be extremely interesting as not only do ants work extremely hard, but they rarely sleep. They typically move as one unit with one ultimate purpose, which is pleasing the queen while she sits back and focuses on keeping the population up for the colony. But in this case, the queen was Rock. They are often referred to as small but mighty, very much like how Rock wanted his religious sect to operate. 
Those who were now a part of the Ant Hill Kids were forced to cut off their friends and families, cut off all ties with those associated with the church. Like I mentioned before, they had to sell their homes and quit their jobs. Their birth names were ultimately just thrown away, and he gave each of them a biblical name. This is a very key part of cult culture, is renaming you, giving you a new identity, which is inherently linked to the leader and the leader alone. So your self-purpose, your self-worth, everything comes from them. As Rock began really leading the church, he kind of got rid of those ideologies which meant that he wasn't supposed to drink and he quickly formed a drinking problem where no one was allowed to consume alcohol but him. In 1978, Rock had told his followers that God had warned him that the end of the world was imminent and that the world would end in February of 1979. He also alleged that God told him that they must move to a commune isolated from society in order to prepare and ensure that they would be on the right side of things when the end of the world hit. He told them that the world was going to end in a shower of boulder-like hailstones and the only way to survive was to escape the evils of society and revert back to nature. This same year, he and the Ant Hill kids moved to a mountainside which he called the Eternal Mountain in St. George's of the Gaspe Peninsula area as it was sparsely populated and he told his followers that since they were there, God would just skip over the area, leaving them free from harm and destruction. This allowed Rock to essentially do whatever he wanted as they were all isolated. He told them that the road to heaven would be filled with suffering, but that was God's will, preparing them for the years of abuse that they were about to ensue. Once they moved out there, everyone but Rock began to immediately work tirelessly to build up the commune. This is when they were kind of officially given the name Ant Hill Kids. They worked diligently to build log cabins for some to live in while others lived in tents. How this is decided is unclear, but I'm just basically assuming that it would go on how Rock liked you. Like if he liked you a lot, then you would be given a log cabin and he would somehow say that that was from God. And if he didn't like you that much, or if you were a little bit more resistant, or if you didn't do as much work, then you would live in the tent. And he would also say that that was from God. They provided for themselves financially by selling baked goods to the locals. And so they became somewhat a part of the community. They wore identical tunics as a way to prove their commitment to the commune and as a way to represent equality. This is also a key part of cult culture is wearing the same clothes or just adopting like a one-minded sense of community. At this point, Rock was exclusively referred to as Moses or Pappy. At first, things seemed to be going well and people didn't really question Rock that much until his 1979 prediction of the world ending did not come true. And this is when he really began to unravel. People naturally started to question him about how the hell they were still alive and the world was intact. And people started to question him, his teachings, but also his so-called wisdom. He defended himself by saying that the time on earth and God's timing weren't the same, they didn't line up. So it was a simple miscommunication between the two of them that led to a miscalculation on his part. But he also said that the world didn't end because of the differences between the Israelite calendar and the Roman Catholic calendar, basically just coming up with whatever excuses he could to get his followers off of his back. He did not take the responsibility for this miscalculation or mistake, but he just blamed everything on God. People were naturally extremely skeptical, and so all this did was make Rock become a more controlling, restrictive, and problematic leader. He began to completely veer away from being a religious leader, and he went on to become a drunk, violent man who enjoyed abusing as many people as he could. Rock's drinking became increasingly worse with him drinking liquor and beer quite heavily. Whenever he was drunk, he often flew into violent rages and just assaulted everyone. He justified these beatings by saying that he did it because everyone else was too spiritually weak to do it themselves. Like, ooh, I do not like this guy. He had extremely strict rules about what his followers could and could not do. Meanwhile, he was allowed to do whatever he wanted to whomever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Members were not allowed to speak to one another unless Rock was present. The population of the commune continued to increase and by 1980, they had a population of approximately 40 members, all of whom were completely hypnotized by his charismatic ways and fell victim to his varying forms of manipulation and control. Nobody questioned his judgment and nobody openly blamed him for the controlling and abusive ways of his nature, but it became increasingly clear that it was no longer about upholding a pure and equal society, but it was far more important for Rock to get his way. At some point, he banned everybody from having romantic and sexual relationships unless they got permission from him. 
Brock then told his cult that in order to keep the population up, he had to marry all of the women and get them pregnant. And everyone's just like, yeah, you know what? That makes complete sense, King. Go off, go ahead. And so he made it a rule that every woman in the cult had to become pregnant by him as a religious requirement. Oh, you nasty. He would go on to have 26 children with nine different women. He would also go on to physically and sexually abuse all of his children. One of his sons, Francois, says that he was so scared of his father when he was small. He recalls that Rock would say his name and he would tremble like a leaf. When his father drank, he knew that they would be paid a visit, which would equate to abuse of some sort. He said that his father was a shark who needed to see blood. All of the commune members by this point were physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. Everyone was exhausted from working ridiculous hours to survive in the wilderness. Many suffered from exhaustion and malnutrition, which also allowed them to become completely dependent on Rock's leadership as they were now weak in, their, in any will that remained within them to fight. In 1981, something switched within Rock and he hit a violent streak that would just never end. He claimed to be a holy being in which he would take on the role of surgeon and would perform unnecessary procedures which can really only be classified as torture as a way to demonstrate his God-given healing powers. Allegedly, allegedly. The members would hold down the selected individual and Rock would begin to torture them using kitchen utensils, pliers, blow torches, and other items that he could find. Many would lose limbs, fingers and toes to his quote unquote surgical procedures. He would put women's nipples in vice grips. He would inject 94% ethanol into their stomachs and he would perform circumcisions on adults and children alike. He began to torture followers who he deemed to be straying from him. He would do so by spying on them and claiming that God had told him what they had done wrong as a way to instill fear in them and deter them all from going against him. He would also punish those who just didn't bring in enough money or those who he claimed weren't working hard enough, even though he wasn't working at all. He would beat them with belts or hammers. He would force members to break their own legs with sledgehammers to prove their loyalty and commitment to them. He would hit them with both sides of an axe. He would force them to sit on lit stoves, to shoot each other in the shoulders, to eat dead mice insects along with human and animal feces. He would amputate their arms and legs for no reason and he would strip them naked and force them to sit outside while in the winter while he was whipping and beating them. If he had suspected that a follower wanted to leave, he would hang them from the ceiling, pluck each and every hair off of their body one at a time, and he would defecate on them. He also claimed that the punishment was happening as it was his mission to stay true to the religious mission which they had initially set out on. And so he would purify his followers by putting them through torturous, abusive, quote unquote, purification sessions. Often after committing these acts, the next day he would cry about what he had done, make a public spectacle of himself and would beg God to stop commanding him to commit such brutality. He would promise that the abuse would end and it never did. As I mentioned before, the children were physically and sexually abused. They would be held over fires and burned, nailed to trees, while other children were forced to throw stones at them. However, one two-year-old boy named Samuel got the worst of it. In 1981, while the members were out partying, because by this time, Rock had let everyone drink when he said so, they left 15 of the children in the care of Guy Veer. He was disabled, and one of Rock's many loyal followers who had actually joined the cult after running away from a Quebec City mental institution. When they came back, they saw that Guy had badly beaten Samuel because Sam would not stop crying. Because of how badly he was beaten, Samuel had difficulty going to the bathroom. To fix this, Rock had sliced his wiener open. Samuel eventually died due to his injuries and the cult panicked a little bit, but they then made the decision to burn the boy's body and hide any evidence of his death. And by the cult making this decision, I mean Rock made the decision and told them to do it. Months after Samuel had died, Rock then decided to host a court, which found Guy not guilty by reason of insanity, but decided to punish Guy anyway for causing Samuel's death, when in reality that was Rock's fault. 
but Guy was castrated. Somehow, I'm not sure how this ended up happening, the truth was leaked to the public and the cult was raided by police, where Rock and seven of the other members were arrested. On September 29th, 1982, Rock pled guilty to criminal negligence for Guy's castration. At the time, he and seven of his followers who were also arrested were all convicted of criminal negligence causing bodily harm for Samuel's death. Rock served 18 months at Orsonville Prison near Quebec City. In June of 1984, he and his followers were released from jail. In October of 1984, the Quebec government issued a nationwide alert to child welfare authorities. This worried social workers, especially those who were already concerned about the commune, and they began to monitor the cult activities more closely than ever before. After they were released, Rock decided that it was best for them to get the hell out of Quebec, and so he purchased 200 acres of land near Burnt River, Ontario, in the woods near Ledge Hill Road, which is just about 100 kilometers northeast of Toronto. He and the remainder of the Ant Hill kids packed up and moved to their new commune. However, some had gone back to their normal life while Rock was in jail, but most of them remained loyal at this point, 26 of which were children, majority of those children being his own. Once they had made the move, they worked very hard again, like ants, to rebuild their commune. They rebuilt the cabins, they built furniture for themselves, and because it was a warmer climate, they began to grow fruit and vegetables. In this new community, they began to support themselves by making and selling maple syrup, fruit preserves, bread, and smoking fish, running their business called Ant Hill Kids, where they also sold handmade goods. They were once again trying to mesh with the community for acceptance. And it seemed like Rock was turning over a new leaf, but his drinking began once again, and it increased immensely. So the abuse just continued. He began to do absolutely sick things for his own amusement simply because he could get away with it. He would regularly take at least two of his wives to bed at once and host contests to see who could have the most orgasms. He would carry out gladiator tournaments in which his followers would be forced into a dirt ring and forced to fight while he watched them. They would step inside a square that was outlined in the dirt. He would make them strip naked and fight for three minutes straight due to his amusement. He would count points, one for a punch, minus for stepping outside of the line, etc. The winners would have to fight someone else and the rounds could go on for hours. Within a few years of them moving to Ontario, people began to call authorities to report their concerns about the fact that winter was on its way and the compound had no hydro. Bob Gallopew was the first Children's Aid Society officer to venture onto the commune in the summer of 1984. He went with a bunch of police officers, a ministry of community and social services, a nurse, and another colleague. When they first arrived, everyone scattered, like they just ran away, and the only person who emerged was Rock himself, who Bob said came off as extremely cautious, but he was super polite. He said that when he first went, he was extremely impressed with the workmanship. My God, who the hell cares? The nurse checked over the children and everyone seemed to be healthy. Bob also spoke to the children and they didn't have any immediate concerns, so they left. But keep in mind, this is all happening under Rock's watchful eye, so they know if they say anything, they, their siblings, or their parents or mother will be tortured and abused, so they're not going to say anything. Bob said that something felt off, so he and his co-workers did what they could to learn more about the history of the cult and keep tabs on them to try and ensure that everyone was safe. In January of 1985, another child died in the commune. After an autopsy was completed, the coroner said that the child had died due to sudden infant death syndrome, but it was later determined that Elazar Lavallee, one of Rock's wives, left her newborn child outside in a wheelbarrow to die in the midst of a blizzard in freezing temperatures, and she said that she did this as a way to keep him away from the immense levels of abuse that he would face if he had survived. This compiled with other reports of babies being held over open fires, sexual abuse, and clipping of toes gave the CAS the evidence they needed to go in and apprehend the children. They gave the mothers an opportunity to leave with their children, but most of them said no. On December 6th, 1985, 10 social workers and six police officers raided the commune. They apprehended 14 children who were ranging in age from five months old to about 16 years old. 
The children were placed in foster care where they would go on to discuss the abuse that they faced. During this time, it would come out that Rock had forced them to perform sexual acts for him and other males in the commune, as they were not allowed to sleep with his wives, so instead he used the children. Rock had also brought one of his sons to Toronto to meet and be assaulted by a sex worker. From 1986 to 1988, Rock had decided that he needed to step up the amount of children that he had, in part because a lot of his children had been apprehended. So in these two years alone, he would go on to have nine more children. All of these children were, however, apprehended within days of birth. Despite being completely aware of the consistent abuse and the harmful things that were going on, authorities were only completely focused on saving the children, not preventing further harm for future children born into the cult. And so after the apprehension of the children, a lot of people had left because they weren't really with what was going on. And I think the removal of the children allowed them to see the situation more clearly for what it actually was rather than what Rock was telling them it was. The commune continued with two men and eight women. Now, authorities claim that they couldn't really investigate or do anything other than apprehend the children because the cult was registered as a church, which is a charity, so they were not able to legally investigate the adults. This is where Rock's intelligent plays a huge role. Remember before, I talked about how he knew how to manipulate the law to get his way, so he knew how to do this and sustain his cult for many years to come after he was already incarcerated for the death of a person and the castration of another person. After all of the children were taken, Rock became even more violent, and while intoxicated, he would go on to continue his quote-unquote acts of healing through unnecessary and torturous procedures. On one occasion, he placed an elastic rubber band around the testicle of a follower. After at least eight hours, the man's genitalia became extremely swollen and infected, so Rock simply cut it off and cauterized the wound with a hot iron. What the hell is even that? Something that did not need to be done at all for his own amusement, his own entertainment. On September 28, 1988, one of his wives, Solange Boyard, complained of having a stomach ache. Later on in the day, Rock ordered her onto a kitchen table and stripped her down naked. Rock then punched her in the shoulder and performed an enema by forcing a plastic tube up her you-know-what area, and he poured copious amounts of olive oil and molasses into the tube while it was still inside of her. He then sliced the side of her stomach open in order to pull out her intestine bare-handed. He ripped out a part of it before stuffing the rest back in. He then ordered one of his female followers, Gabrielle Lavalie, to stitch her up using a needle and thread. After she was stitched up, he forced a tube down Solange's throat and made Gabrielle and the other women blow air down the tube. And she did this without any anesthesia, so she was completely aware and awake of everything that was going on, felt every little bit of pain. Somehow, she survived this gruesome attack, but she was in complete pain and agony until she died the next day. After realizing that she died, Rock reminded his few remaining followers of his resurrection abilities and he told them that he would bring Solange back to life. Over the next four weeks, the bringing her back to life process consisted of him telling followers to remove her uterus and saw off a portion of her skull so that the male members could ejaculate onto her brain, which would help bring her back to life. This process was completed about three times. Shockingly, the woman remained dead. And so Rock removed one of her ribs to keep in a leather case around his neck and ordered his followers to cremate her and bury her on the grounds of the commune. In November of 1988, Gabrielle Lavalie, the same woman who was a part of Solange's torture and ultimately her death, complained to Rock about a toothache. Rock then set out to fix the problem by ripping out eight of her teeth with pliers. He then chased her around the commune with a knife and sliced the tendon on her right hand. This attack scared her a lot, and so she tried to flee, but she was unable to. On July 26th of 1989, Gabrielle complained of stiffness in her hand due to the previous attack. Rock was frustrated that she had tried to leave, so he used this as a reason to continue torturing her, beginning with using wire cutters to amputate one of her fingers. He then plunged a knife through her right hand on the kitchen table. He decided that that was not enough, so he needed to amputate her arm. 
He grabbed a meat cleaver and a hunting knife and used both to hack her arm off and left her in the kitchen, laying there in agony, bleeding. She said she knew if she passed out, he would just kill her and she would not wake back up. The following morning, someone, one of the female followers, came in and stitched her up. On August 9th of 1989, the cult turned against Gabrielle once again, but the reason why is somewhat unclear. She was tied up and tortured. They took turns taking blow torches to her genitals. They broke off a needle in her spine and Rock had used a red hot metal rod to cauterize the stump of her severed arm. Rock had cut off a piece of her breast and hit her in the head using one of his favorite tools, which was an ax. This act scared a lot of the followers. So everyone began to plan how they could escape and get away before what happened to Gabrielle happened to them too. On August 16th of 1989, Gabrielle escaped for the second and final time. She was able to hitchhike to a hospital north of Toronto where she told hospital members what happened to her, what all went down in the cult, and most importantly, how she had lost her arm. Gabrielle, telling authorities what happened to her, kicked off a six-week search with helicopters and police dogs to arrest, rock, and dismantle what remained of the cult. On October 6, 1989, police found Rock, who had fled to a camp in his home province of Quebec, where he planned on hiding out with two of his followers. Four days after he was arrested, he pled guilty to a series of charges related to Gabrielle and received 12 years as a sentence, which was later reduced to 10 years after he filed an appeal. While in prison, he was placed in protective custody because of the high number of death threats that were coming towards him by other inmates and some guards, if we're being honest. The freed members were now publicly denouncing the cult and they were doing everything that they could to build their lives back up and put everything back together after years of brainwashing and leaving everything behind. But unfortunately, many remained loyal to Rock after he was imprisoned. He even fathered another four children with the remaining female members during conjugal visits that he was allowed with all of them. How, I don't even under, how he was allowed to have conjugal visits with all four women is really not clear, especially because to my knowledge, especially at this time, polyamory was not legal in Canada and he wasn't legally married to any of these women anyways. So they were really just in jail, treating him like he wasn't a bad guy because he was charming and manipulative, even though he had done all of this stuff. Gabrielle continued to come forward about her experiences, what she had witnessed and been a part of while a member of the Ant Hill Kids. This triggered further investigation into Rock and his actions and eventually allowed them to recover Solange's body. On October 24th, 1989, Rock was charged with Solange's murder, to which he received a life sentence. In 1993, Rock was described by authorities as cooperative and claimed that he was working on his rehabilitation process. What's not clicking? This obviously is not true as he was still manipulating and controlling his followers from within the confines of prison. If he had told them to commit crimes on his behalf, they would have done it. But because they held him in such high regard, he was offered a transfer to a lower security prison, but he denied that because he wanted, wanted to remain close to his wives, but more specifically, Francine Laflamme, who was his favorite at the time. Francine, Chantelle Labrie, and Nicole Ruel owned and operated a bakery together and lived in joining rented cabins, which were less than a kilometer away from Mill Haven's gates, which is where Rock was incarcerated. Francine wanted to be interviewed, but had to gain his consent to be interviewed by McLean's magazine, which he gave her. In this interview, she recalls that the Children's Aid Society gave her two choices, to stay with Rock and lose your child, or to leave Rock and keep your child. She decided she wasn't going to leave him, so they took her children. She said it was a difficult decision, and she wanted to kill the people who took them. It was now five years after making that decision, and she said she regretted nothing. She was still madly in love with Rock, and she was anxiously awaiting his release. She said that the periods of craziness were due to Rock's excessive drinking, which stemmed from an unhappy childhood, which, sure, some people might drink and they might abuse after experiencing a childhood like his, but they don't do the things that he did. But she was just basically justifying everything, trying to make him look good. I'm assuming that all of this was done so that he would be able to get an early release. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. She complained in an interview that people tried to make the love of her life sound like a monster, like a butcher, but he just wasn't. 
She described him as a marvelous man who was full of passion, intelligence, and originality. The woman was too stunned to speak. So it's very clear that she was still brainwashed and that this brainwashing was able to be sustained because she was having regular contact and regular physical access to him. In 2000, Rock was transferred to Dorchester Penitentiary in Dorchester, New Brunswick. In 2002, Rock applied for parole and was rejected as he was considered high risk to reoffend, and so he wouldn't try to apply again. In 2009, Rock tried to sell his artwork on an American-based website which calls itself a true crime auction house, which was willing to sell his drawings and paintings that he created while he was in prison. The Correctional Service of Canada, however, blocked this from happening as the federal public safety minister wrote to them to express concerns that Rock was benefiting from the very crimes that he was supposed to be punished for. On February 26th, 2011, at age 63, Rock got into an altercation with his 60-year-old Selly, convicted murderer Matthew Gerard McDonald, who was also serving a life sentence for second-degree murder. What exactly went down is unclear. But Matthew walked down to the guard station this day holding a bloody shiv, gave it to them, and said, that piece of shit is down on the range. Here's the knife. I've sliced him up. I'm supposed to feel sorry for that bitch. I don't. Matthew had previously voiced his dislike for Rock due to his convictions of causing harm to women and children, which he thought was just like a big no. That's just something you don't do. Matthew was charged with second degree murder for Rock's death, but he was already serving a life sentence, so there was no additional time added onto his sentence. He's an icon. She's a legend. Francois Thoreau, one of Rock's many children, said that he was not surprised when he found out that his father was dead in his cell. He was surprised that he hadn't been killed sooner. And I, oh! In 2009, he and his brother, Rock Sylvain, published a book talking about their experiences. And they said that talking about it frees them from the horrors that they lived through. I will leave a link to that in the description below. So we have now come to the part of the episode where I give my thoughts. I personally had never heard of Ant Hill Kids really before I started doing this research on this case. Like this is one of the most horrendous cult cases I have personally ever heard of and it's one of the only cases I have heard of where the leader was imprisoned for acts relating to the cult and then was able to get out, continue the cult, and continue doing such horrendous acts because he was underneath the religious sect. Um, but the fact that it was a Canadian cult and I'd never heard of it is also very telling. I do have a few other cult episodes focusing on Canadian cults in the works because I don't think that they're talked about. And they're just as brutal, if not more brutal, than others that I've heard about. I do think that a huge reason why Rock was able to get away with this for as long as he did is because he was a white man and he was charismatic and charming. And that's why he was given such good reports and people liked him even when he was in prison. Like, after they knew everything that he had done, it had all come out, they were still like, yeah, he's a great guy. When he's not. Literally not at all. I do think that a lot of the things that he went on to do throughout his adulthood were things that were taught to him from his childhood, right? So learning to be extremely abusive, that was something that his father and his mother were to him. Learning to use religion as a way to manipulate people, something that, again, both his parents taught him to do. And I do think that there were every indication that he was going to start a cult as soon as he left the church with the other members and nothing was done. And this is where, this is what gets me. They were out and they were living as a part of the community. So if you're out and you're living like a part of the community and they suspect something's going on, but they don't say anything. This whole case, like I already look at police and child welfare services and things of that nature very sideways, but this case made me look at them even more sideways. Because if you have a case like this, where it's very blatant, the abuse, everything is egregious and horrific and horrendous, and you don't intervene and you don't do anything, then what are you there for? What are you there for? Like really, truly, that's my only question at the end of this case. I think it's for religious reasons. 